Hi, everybody. Welcome to the School of Design's Design the Future Lecture Series. I'm really pleased to have the speaker with us tonight. Oh, it's me. It's me. Um, I'm here because it, there's snow outside. We learned several years ago that trying to fly our lecturers in in February just didn't work. So now one of us gets propped up every February to give a lecture, and this year it's me. <laughs> so thanks for coming. Appreciate it. Um, we are live streaming this lecture. We live stream most of our Design the Future lecture series, and I'm going to get these numbers and stats wrong, but I believe in the past we sometimes have up to 100, 150 people from maybe eight or nine different countries. So if you've tuned in, th thank you. Um, in this talk tonight, I want to introduce transition design. It's a relatively new area of design research, study, and practice that is aimed at systems level change and societal transitions towards more sustainable futures. And transition design aspires to do two things, really. Develop design-based tools and methods that can aid transdisciplinary teams working on complex problems with large consequences and to prepare new generations of designers who will be qualified to work on those teams. So transition to design brings together two global memes. And the first is the idea that entire societies must transition toward more sustainable futures. And second, the realization that these transitions will require intentional systems level change. And you can see evidence of these memes in the number of transition related projects and initiatives springing up around the world and the recent rise of what I'll call deep systems thinking and the proliferation of knowledge, tools, and processes for understanding complex systems and systems problems. Now, it's really important to say at the onset that our societies are always in a constant state of transition. But these transitions are largely unintentional, they're full of drift, and we really only understand their ramifications in hindsight. We call it history. But the question before us in the 21st century is really whether or not we can intentionally direct these transitions towards more sustainable futures. <clears throat> now, transition design is concerned largely with two kinds of systems, socio-technical systems and wicked problems, which are really systems problems. Socio-technical systems are tangles of societal infrastructure, people, and all manner of designed artifacts, processes, and scripted interactions. And all of these, of course, are embedded within the natural world. Now, the list of wicked problems is long, and it will get longer. Both socio-technical systems and wicked problems exhibit characteristics of living systems. They exist at multiple levels of scale. They are interconnected and interdependent. They're self-organizing. They display emergent properties, and their dynamics are governed by feedback loops. Therefore, changes in one area of a system ramify throughout in unpredictable ways. Now, these systems are everywhere, and their ubiquity is perhaps, perhaps best explained by this old joke. Two fish bump into each other, and one says, how's the water? And the other replies, what water? Marshall McLuhan, in his book War and Peace in the Global Village, said, one thing fish know nothing about is water, since they have no anti-environment, which would enable them to perceive the element they live in. So my point is that systems are so ubiquitous, and our interactions with them are so pervasive we don't really see them, and therefore, we don't understand them very well. But these unnoticed systems produce their own patterns of behavior over time. They become entrenched and intractable, and therefore, are unintentionally directing our societal transitions toward unsustainable futures. Transition design aspires to develop an approach to 
shift that trajectory of these systems strate through strategically placed, designed interventions over short, mid, and long horizons of time. Transition design resembles ac Chinese acupuncture in its approach. So acupuncturists look for points of intervention that have the greatest potential to transition the system back into balance and health. Now, where those needles are placed can seem wildly counterintuitive, but is actually based upon a deep understanding of the body systems dynamics. Transition design proposes a similar approach to seed and catalyze the transition of our socio-technical ecological systems towards sustainability. And a group of scientists, engineers, and researchers in Northern Europe have been mapping the anatomy of historical socio-technical transitions for nearly two decades. It's kind of crazy, but they have. They're, they've been essentially providing a roadmap for initiating these transitions. We think it also needs to integrate social practices, human behavior, and worldviews into its approach, but it's nonetheless proving to be a very useful framework for thinking about complex societal transitions. The Sustainability Transitions Network has identified three key systems levels, the landscape, the regime, and the niche. And they argue that systems transitions are always the result of both large and small scale events, technological innovations and breakthroughs, and changes in beliefs, social norms, and practices in everyday life. This diagram shows how the events, innovations, and changes at different systems levels sparked the historical transition from horse-drawn carriage to automobile. Now, I've highlighted just one of the shifts or destabilizations that contributed to this transition. So the invention of electricity at the landscape level opened up the possibility at the niche level for unchallenged experiments like the electric tram. The tram's success changed the entire infrastructure at the regime level in the form of paved streets as transport arteries. This regime change led to the phenomenon of suburbanization at the landscape level, which in turn changed the way generations of people have lived their lives. These researchers hypothesize that if we can better understand how these transitions happened in the past, then we should be able to intentionally seed transitions towards more positive futures. Transition design aspires to develop new tools for doing just that. Strategically placed, small and large design interventions have the potential to shift entire socio-technical systems over time. As an example, take a community's need to transition toward water security. Transition designers might read the socio-technical historical landscape to understand what led to the water shortage in the first place, then identify leverage points for change, strategically placed design interventions that can seed and catalyze systems transition toward a more desirable future. But the question, of course, is a transition toward what? This is the point at which it becomes clear that a new approach is needed that integrates a rigorous and creative process for thinking about long-term futures. And that is why Stuart Candy is sitting in the audience and should be talking about these next few slides, not me. Even a cursory search on Google or Pinterest reveals a staggering array of futuring and foresighting tools and methodologies that have sprung up in recent years. And now there is a clear intersection between foresight studies and design. Future, Stuart really joined our faculty this year and is working right now with others to integrate a foresight strand into design curricula and research efforts here at the School of Design. I think maybe we're the first to do it and we're very excited about that. 
So the transition design approach sits at the intersection of foresighting and systems design with an emphasis on resolving and leveraging stakeholder relations. Visioning and backcasting are two important aspects of transition design that are based upon the simple premise that if we don't have a clear vision of where we want to go, we won't stand a chance of getting there. The co-creation of visions of desirable futures enables stakeholders with conflicting agendas to try and transcend their differences in the present and enter a space in which they can focus on their common values, hopes, and desires. Political activist and author Stephen Duncombe said, visions can inspire us to imagine that things could be radically different than they are today, and then believe we can progress toward that imaginary world. These long-term visions also act as both a magnet or an attractor, to use the language of complexity theory, drawing us toward the desired future and a compass that guides the creation of projects and initiatives in the present. Fred Polak, one of the founding fathers of futures, future studies said, when the dominant images of a culture are anticipatory, they lead social development and provide a direction for social change. And Stuart Brand in his book, The Clock of the Long Now asks, how do we make long-term thinking automatic and common instead of difficult and rare? Transition design proposes that one of the roots of wicked problems is actually our inability to think in long horizons of time. So we fail to consider the consequences of our actions and our designs. Western societies think in terms of fiscal quarters, fashion seasons, or perhaps annual projections, but rarely do we think farther out. Resolving wicked problems, however, will require design for the long-term future, for dozens of years, decades, or even centuries. Wicked problems took a very long time to get wicked and will therefore take a very long time to resolve. The cone of the future is a foresighting approach that refutes the idea that the future is inevitable, fixed, and static. Rather, it is a broad realm of probabilities that can be explored through rigorous ways and preferable futures can be defined and articulated at high levels of fidelity. And here is how we're trying to put it all together. The emerging transition design approach calls for deep stakeholder involvement and proposes a three, three context setting steps. Step one helps stakeholders achieve a shared understanding of the problem, resolve their conflictual relations, and leverage points of alignment. Step two enables stakeholders to co-create compelling visions of long-term desirable futures towards which they want to transition. It also establishes radically large spatio-temporal context for both the problem and the vision. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. Step three involves backcasting from that desired future vision to create a transition pathway along which ecologies of interventions can be situated. And it looks something like this. Ecologies of interventions at multiple levels of scale implemented over multiple time horizons, connected to each other and the future vision. These ecologies act as steps along this transition pathway. They're comprised of both new and existing projects of all kinds, and this is where social innovation in particular co connects to the transition design approach, at the level of designing discrete systems interventions. The problem that transition design attempts to address is the one-off nature and relatively short timelines of most design solutions or interventions due to the tight problem frames that we usually impose. In many traditional design approaches, practitioners and researchers either find or are given a problem that is clearly defined within a relatively small context. In other words, a manageable problem that we've probably solved before. 
This is what Horst Rattel would call a tame problem. Now, if we frame all problems within tight, tidy frames, we can solve them every time with the approaches we already have. We do this in the posture of the expert who says, I've seen this before, I know what to do, just get out of my way and let me do it. I've said it numbers of times myself. If, however, we include social and environmental concerns in the problem frame and consider all of the stakeholders affected by the problem, things start to change very quickly. And we realize that the problem we think we see is really just a symptom of something much bigger. And it starts to feel something like this. The more you trace the roots of a wicked problem up systems levels, the more intimidating it gets. When and if you're able to finally see the entire problem, it's overwhelming. If you persist and consider the context of the problem, which is the larger socio-technical ecological systems within which it's embedded, then things get really gnarly. And that's about the time you hear people say, as Horst Rattel did, that problem is simply unsolvable. Or, to mix metaphors, I can't put a dent in that. Anything I do would be like a drop in the ocean. This is the scale at which it becomes clear that no single individual, no single discipline or profession can solve a wicked problem or transition an entire system. The sheer magnitude of the problem and its context demands transdisciplinarity, radical collaboration, tenacity, and patience. And we think a new process for solving problems and seeding systems level change. Transition design works with stakeholders to develop a long-term vision of a future in which the problem has been resolved. Then undertakes a process of auditing existing one-off solutions within both the problem frame and context to determine which ones have the potential to be connected to each other and the long-term vision. Some projects will be in natural alignment, while others might need some slight adjustments to integrate into that ecology of interventions that we advocate. This approach also reveals potential points of intervention where new projects can be situated to catalyze exponential change. And here is where the acupuncture metaphor comes in again. The challenge is how to methodically and productively explore large socio-technical contexts and the wicked problems contained within them. So we've been working with a concept <clears throat> that we call the spatio-temporal matrix within which both the problem and the future vision are situated. It's essentially a sketch for conducting research and a template for articulating future visions. We ask research questions unique to each area of this matrix and think of it as looking up and down in space and backwards and forwards in time. We situate both the problem and the vision at the mid-systems level in order to look at how both large and small events contribute to the problem and can inform a different future. We look at the past because the origin of wicked problems always lies there. It took problems a long time to get wicked. We look at how people in the past were living and what social norms were before the problem arose. We, in the present, we look for contributing factors at all levels of scale and their ramifications for society as well as everyday life. But in the future, stakeholders further articulate their visions and ask, how might social norms and beliefs have changed if the problem had been resolved? What technologies might or might not exist? How would everyday life and lifestyles have changed, hopefully for the better? Exploring this radically large context informs the design of ecologies of interventions that live at multiple levels of scale and that are implemented over short mid and long horizons of time. As an example, 
Consider the problem of break-ins and muggings in my neighborhood. To address the problem, we might increase the number of police on the beat, start a block watch, an email group, and make sure everybody has burglar alarms in their houses and pepper spray in their backpacks. But that's really not getting at the roots of the problem. We can see that these break-ins and muggings are connected to the bigger wicked problem of crime at the city level. And at the city level, crime is related to other wicked problems, such as drug addiction, gang violence, a lack of affordable housing, a rising divorce rate, racial profiling, unemployment, gentrification, and an influx of high-tech businesses and employees, to name only a few. But the roots of these problems have connections at the national level that involve really big problems, such as bank bailouts, federal penal codes, Supreme Court rulings, the housing market collapse, the opioid epidemic, the high cost of education, lack of prison vocation programs, and widespread unemployment. Now, depending upon how you look at it, this can be overwhelming or it can become an opportunity to look for leverage points within the bigger system and develop interventions designed to address as many problems as possible simultaneously. That is really the concept behind transition design. A transition design solution would involve an ecology of interventions at multiple levels of scale and might include a national policy that mandates vocational training in federal prisons, a citywide initiative aimed at drug rehabilitation, and a neighborhood mentoring program for at-risk youth. All of these interventions and many more would be considered those acupuncture needles aimed at resolving the wicked problem of crime and transitioning the entire system over time. We developed the transition design framework as a way to bring together the transdisciplinary knowledge we felt necessary to seed and catalyze systems level change. It consists of four mutually influencing, co-evolving areas of knowledge and skill sets. We need visions of where we want to go. We need better theories of change that explain how change in complex systems can be seeded and catalyzed. And we argue that new mindsets and postures are required for doing this important work. Postures of radical collaboration, generosity, and a more ecological worldview. And we say that new ways of designing will emerge out of the previous three. Each area of the framework is comprised of a palette of transdisciplinary practices that can be configured in situation and place-specific ways. Some of the practices we're using and discussing with our students right now are useful in framing complex problems helping to identify and, and resolve conflictual stakeholder relations, and facilitate the co-creation of long-term lifestyle-based visions of sustainable futures. While others are relevant to designing tangible, sustainable interventions that can destabilize entrenched systems and begin to nudge their trajectories towards more sustainable futures. We're experimenting with applying these practices in a rough three-phased approach. So we reframe the project, we reframe the present and the future in a large spatio-temporal context so that a shared understanding of the problem is achieved and stakeholder relations begin to be addressed through the co-creation of a long-term desirable vision. These visions inform the creation of design interventions, tangible projects and initiatives that will resemble the way that we're working now. The difference is that instead of projects and initiatives being one-off solutions, they take the form of ecologies of interventions that act as steps along that transition pathway toward the desired future. Now, the third phase will be the most difficult, doing nothing. Because we can't predict how a system will respond to the designed interventions, we must wait. 
like the acupuncturist, to see what the system's response is. This will be in conflict with the dominant socioeconomic paradigms that call for quick, decisive actions that render quick, profitable results. This phase is undertaken in a posture of speculation and patient observation, and it will require compelling narratives about why doing nothing is sometimes crucial. So we've been developing and testing many of these ideas in an engagement with the city of Ojai, California, to frame their severe water shortage as a transition design problem. In January and May of 2017, we ran two workshops that were attended by the mayor, city council people, uh, residents, and multiple stakeholder groups to introduce the approach and ask if it could help address what will undoubtedly be a decades-long transition toward water security. The workshops asked stakeholder groups to map the wicked problem in order to achieve a shared understanding, then co-create visions of long-term Ojai futures. They first mapped as many issues as possible within five archetypal areas, infrastructure and technology, social issues, environmental issues, political issues, and economic issues. And after list, yeah, and we think now maybe legal issues ought to be another category on this map. <clears throat> we also asked stakeholders to map interconnections and interdependencies within the problem itself. And we think that perhaps this is the most crucial piece in addressing a wicked problem looking at the connections between people, problems, and things. These are like the acupuncture meridians, and we don't yet have the tools to enable us to do that well. And so are stakeholder relations. One of the biggest challenges in Ojai is the problem of conflicting stakeholder agendas. Stakeholder opposition is often the main barrier to complex problem resolution, especially a problem as survival-related as water. Asking stakeholders to list their concerns and fears, as well as their hopes and desires, reveals not only oppositions among them, but unexpected alignments and common objectives. It can foster empathy among stakeholder groups that help them transcend their differences in the present by revealing areas in which they actually agree. And it's important to emphasize that differences often originate in conflicting belief systems and cultural norms. Beliefs and assumptions are individual and collective in nature, and they utterly direct how we solve for complex problems. In fact, our worldviews direct whether or not we even see a problem. Views like the ones shown here are barriers to resolving complex problems, and they touch on almost every topic from how to address a community's water shortage to whether or not to build a wall between two countries. Stakeholder beliefs and assumptions vary widely. And in Ojai, they have been the barrier to productive action in addressing the water shortage. But it's important to note that any wicked problem will always involve stakeholders whose voices cannot be heard. For this reason, advocates for other must be appointed. The transition design approach draws on the work of Australian uh, activist and ecologist John Seed, who developed an approach called the Council of All Beings. And it advocates, it, it appoints advocates on behalf of stakeholders who, whose voices can't be heard. In the case of o, the Ojai watershed, Lake Casitas, and the local indigenous population, the Chumash tribe, are two stakeholder groups very unlikely to ever be touched through normal research or the workshops that we were holding. But if possible, every single, every single strand in the web of life affected by the problem must be considered in stakeholder research. Once all stakeholder groups are identified, the objective, of course, is to reveal conflicting fears or concerns as well as hopes and desires, both of which are always connected to that group's ability to satisfy their needs. This research will reveal where oppositions must be resolved 
but more importantly, where lines of affinity can be leveraged in creating solutions. Prior to the workshop, we hypothesized that there would be more red lines of opposition than green lines of affinity between most groups, and that proved to be true. Although observations and insights from the workshops are not conclusive, what we feel did result is a sketch for conducting qualitative field research with the stakeholders themselves that will either refute or validate the problem, stakeholder, and relation maps created in the workshops. So during the workshops, we conducted this thing called the stakeholder triad exercise that mapped relations within groups who were the most likely to strongly disagree. So here we see a second generation avocado farmer a lower income resident, and the owner of a five-star tourist resort, all of whom, as you can imagine, have wildly divergent views on the water shortage. From the farmer's point of view, his family have been in Ojai for generations, which gives them the right to as much water as they need. He says if, it weren't, if there weren't so many damn, tour, many damn tourists in town, water wouldn't be an issue. The lower income resident resents the fact that his water is rationed while rich tourists staying at the resort can take five showers a day if they want to. He also complains that avocados are a hugely water intensive crop and resents the fact that farmers aren't being rationed. He feels it just isn't fair when his family is barely getting by. The owner of the five star resort feels her hotel is the backbone of the local economy provides jobs for many locals, and pays above-scale wages. She feels her organization is on the receiving end of a lot of undeserved criticism. She believes a booming tourist industry is good for Ojai. So you can see what I mean about the dynamic. But here's the point. Once you get at these core beliefs each group has about the problem, Viewpoints that are in complete opposition to one another are revealed, and yet they all make complete sense from that group's point of view. And that's important. If you're asking the right questions, everyone's point of view makes sense. But it's equally important to reveal where alignments are. The farmer and his family love the Ojai Valley and its natural beauty, they take pride in creating jobs for local people who now have homes and families there. Similarly, the lower income resident loves the Ojai lifestyle. People are friendly, their kids are getting a good education, and it's a really safe place to live. The resort owner knows that guests come there to enjoy the natural beauty, the unique culture and lifestyle, and she doesn't want to lose that. These are things she herself loves. So the common love of the natural beauty, local culture, and lifestyle are areas in which almost every stakeholder group is in alignment, and this opens up possibilities for developing shared future visions and present-day projects that become steps toward that vision. It's also crucial to say, however, that the stakeholders themselves discover these conflicts and alignments and begin to develop a greater understanding and empathy for the diverse points of view that underpin the complex problem. Most of them ended up saying, holy crap, I really didn't realize it was this complex. And it looks something like this. It's messy and rather boisterous, but it also was full of laughter. By introducing the dynamics of play and gaming into the, pro the process of looking for lines of conflict, <laughs> stakeholders developed relationships with people they previously viewed as opponents or, in some cases, lunatics. They become advocates for the process itself and representatives of the diversity of stakeholder viewpoints that are present. But as you all know, our Little Ojai project took a drastic turn last December. Many of you probably followed the fires and subsequent landslides in Ojai and Montecito. When the fire broke out, we were in Sydney, Australia, and went to bed expecting to wake up that next Saturday morning and hear that Ojai had literally burned to the ground. Almost all of our friends and par partners were forced to evacuate the city and many couldn't return for more than a week because of the particulate matter that remained in the air. 
This is the Thomas Fire Map, and what you are seeing here is literally a miracle. Against all odds, the city survived with the loss of about 100 homes. The fire was the largest in California history. It burned for six weeks, consumed 440 square miles, over 100,000 people were evacuated, and 8,500 firefighters mobilized. Over 1,000 structures were lost at a cost of $120 million. Even more alarmingly, the Santa Ana winds that drove that fire were the strongest and of the longest duration ever seen. And at the height of the fire, it actually generated its own weather. This is a, hist a fire history map of that same region. So within the past 20 years, there have been more than 25 fires and the weather is becoming ever more extreme. Sporadic rainfall, increasing temperatures, and longer, stronger Santa Ana winds. But as we know, the Thomas Fire was only the beginning. What began as a project to transition a community to water security has become a project to transition a community to climate resiliency. And changing the problem frame has challenged us to better understand how climate-related events are interconnected and interdependent. Now, Montecito, California is an affluent community about 30 miles, 45 minutes west of Ojai. Oprah lives there. This map shows the network of the creeks and waterways that lace the surrounding mountains and flow down to the flat coastal plain on which the town is situated. And as you can see here, the hills were ravaged by the Thomas Fire. People evacuated Montecito in haste and had just moved back to their homes when the rains began. And in the early morning of January 9th, it rained more than a half an inch in 15 minutes, and it rained one inch in Carpinteria. And at 3.30 a.m., the mud came down the mountain. This map shows where the mud flowed and the areas most heavily affected, which, as you can see, are densely populated. But so many questions remain. In an area with a long history of fires, floods, and mudslides, why did so many people not evacuate? Why was the mandatory evacuation zone so limited? Why did so many people go to bed that night when heavy rains were predicted and floods and landslides likely? Transition design asks these questions and many more to try and understand issues related to mindset and behavior, as well as tactical questions such as, how can the hillsides be planted quickly to mitigate further flooding? What does the future hold for property owners who are situated in a wash or arroyo? Was flood and disaster, were flood and disaster insurance rates higher for the homes situated in these washes? If so, then who knew climate vulnerable areas were actually being overdeveloped? And at what point was local indigenous knowledge about natural flood zones lost? So if you examine aerial photographs like this one, it may indicate, we're not sure, it may indicate that at one point development stopped at the natural historic lines of this flood zone. I don't know if I can do this. Is it working? You see how this old growth established orchard follows this really funny organic line? Yeah? And then you see how this new orchard has been planted here? And you note the age of most of these homes that are sitting directly in what has probably always been a flood zone. They're all relatively new. So part of the point is to try and ascertain whether in earlier decades people still connected closely enough with natural weather cycles to know that periodically the arroyos flooded their banks after fires. And if so, how and why was that place-based knowledge lost? And that will require more research. Here's another shot of the houses that are built squarely in the path of the water in what is likely a natural wash. And the inset map shows damaged or destroyed homes in the flood zone. But as you can see, that area is completely 
populated. And when you look at before pictures, there was like, there's one little channel that runs very sleepily through this neighborhood. You know, this very gentle creek, which is fine as long as the climate doesn't change. So there was a shocking loss of life associated with this disaster, and it was perhaps even more shocking because many of those, were aff those affected were among the most affluent and privileged, yet this privilege did not exempt them from this disaster. It was the great leveler. And as often happens after a disaster, protocols are changing. This is a new interactive map showing an expanded threat zone. So residents can now go on to this interactive map to see whether they are at risk in the future. But note that most of Montecito is now at risk during a hard rain. Now, ironically, we're still in the monsoon season, if you're Californian. So while Montecito is praying for no more rain, Ojai, 30 miles east, is on the brink of having a stage four drought warning imposed upon them, and they are praying that it does rain. So a transition design strategy is to understand these climate-related phenomena in order to design interventions that help transition communities toward climate resiliency. Obviously, designers can't do that alone. Transition designers will need to understand the interconnected roots of the problem that are historic and embedded within the natural environment. And these include things like understanding how fires spread and how they continue, how they contribute to floods and landslides. Among the many things we're researching is how the indigenous Chumash tribes manage the land and specifically how they dealt with water shortages and wildfire. Transitioning the region to climate resiliency will require an understanding of the multifaceted and interdependent nature of these interrelated wicked problems. It will involve a com developing a compelling vision of a long-term future that's co-created by all stakeholder groups. And it will require multiple interventions at multiple levels of scale over multiple time horizons. The transition from that shared understanding of the problem to that vision is where the acupuncture metaphor comes in again. Designed intervention, interventions aimed at destabilizing the system and changing its trajectory will involve changing practices and behaviors, developing new policies and legislation, recapturing indigenous place-based wisdom combined with local and regional grassroots actions, and all manner, of course, of new technologies and infrastructures, although ironically, everybody goes for the technology solution first. There's plenty of people in Ojai that think all we need is a desal plant. We just need a desal plant. And of course, all of these, hopefully, will lead to new cultural norms and more place-based lifestyles. But more importantly, it will require that these efforts be tied to each other and the future vision for greater traction over time. And of course, what we learn by working with communities like Ojai must be scalable because climate change has already become the problem of the 21st century. And there is an increasing chance that we may see our country's first climate change refugees coming out of Southern California or my home state of Arizona. However we proceed in the face of enormous complex challenges like this is what we are exploring. And I think this quote by Antonio Machado is very apt for what it's going to be like to do work like this. To address problems whose scale and level of complexity is beyond our ability to fully comprehend. We will be feeling our way and trying to remain open and sensitive to what the system is telling us. And we must do that in concert with people from lots of other disciplines. So to wrap up, I want to touch on another area we're discussing. What are the roles transition designers will play and what are the skill sets required? This is an important area that needs a lot more discussion and thought, but I'll share our thinking so far. 
So we think one of the archetypal roles is that of the acupuncturist, the person who looks for places to intervene in the system and identifies the fights worth fighting from a system's point of view. These are fights or interventions that can change the logic of a debate, the trajectory of a system, or shift mindsets and create new narratives. If all of these can't be, achi be achieved, sometimes the action is to deconstruct old stories and shift narrative frames. The questioner supports deliberation on fundamental questions that create new discourses and cultural shifts. The questioner facilitates dialogues around big questions with large consequences, such as, what is the good life? What are the moral limits of markets? If something is possible, does that mean it's also desirable? The questioner also makes sure that citizens from diverse social groups take part in these de debates. The gardener seeds transition by identifying, connecting, supporting, and spotlighting the pioneers of the new system, by watering the seeds of new ideas and enabling change through emergence. An emergence happens when separate local efforts are connected to form communities of practice. And once this happens, systems level change suddenly appears. The connector, on the other hand, creates connections and learning cycles between systems levels and geographic locations. Complex social systems are comprised of members of civil society and industry that form clusters of informal networks, movements, grassroots organizations, and each has their own language, norms, and belief systems. Connecting these cultures, clusters, to enable learning and information exchange is a key leverage point for change in systems. Socio-technical systems are permeated by designed artifacts, built structures, communications, and scripted behaviors. The maker brings a deep understanding of materiality and human needs to the creation of these design touch points within complex systems. The maker ensures that all of these things are desirable, viable, feasible, and sustainable. These roles illustrate, we think, the transdisciplinary nature of design for transition and the need for people from diverse disciplines to design within them. One of our primary objectives has been to try and constitute an international conversation about the need for systems level change and propose it as a new complementary area of design focus. We hope that one day transition studies will be an integrated topic on most university campuses and that it will bring together global initiatives that are already out there. Things like the Great Transition, the Commons Transition, Transition Towns, Transition Design, um, the Next Systems Project, and many others. So a global network of educators, researchers, and practitioners from different disciplines is emerging. And we now have six partner universities integrating transition design into curricula and research strands. And we're working with four professional design organizations to develop tools for the emerging approach. We've held three annual transition design symposia in the US, the UK, and last summer in Barcelona, Spain. And short courses have been attended by people from all walks of life in more than 20 countries now. Next June, we'll teach another 10-day short course at Schumacher College in the UK, followed by a two-day transition symposium that will bring together representatives from most of these major transition initiatives around the world. Our hope is that within three to five years, transition design can offer tools and methods to transdisciplinary teams working on transition-related projects, and that we will have graduated a new generation of design student capable of joining those teams. So the latest information is really up on our transition design seminar website now. There's a lot of reading, there's a lot of links, and there's an area called additional resources that have a lot of useful um, videos in there. It's an open source syllabus that our partner educators are using to teach from in other parts of the world. And 
everything we've written is up on myacademia.edu page. So that's it. Thank you for coming. So I could take a few questions, or you can skedaddle out into the night. Peter. It's terrific. I have a lot of explanation of what they're doing. The role of government seems to be pretty important. I'm just looking at the Montecito dispute. Yeah. What's going on. How do you, how do you bring them on board? Yeah. Especially in current circumstances. Yeah. Did everybody hear that? Yes. Yeah. What's the role of um, local or regional government? I'm not even going to talk about national government. That would take another lecture. Um, we're facing that, I know, high right now. And I think what we're seeing is as outsiders who are offering an approach, we really need to find ways to build capacity within the community. And that may be funding things that have lines for local leaders. So somebody can be responsible for getting folks from government, folks from all the different organizations on the ground involved, because we can't do that as an outsider. And I know from years of running my own company and working with clients, the dynamic in a way was, was all wrong. So we would rush in, we would take great responsibility for helping solve the problem, we would create solutions, and we were carrying the thing. And the minute we left, they were often at a loss. And I think it's really important that that not happen with the work we're going to be doing with places like Ojai. So we need from the get-go to figure out how to create community leaders or grow community leaders and champions. So the mayor attended and several city council attended and they right now are trying to figure out where they can rob Peter and pay Paul and put some money behind the effort. So with Ojai, I think we'll get the, the local government on board. The bigger problem, weirdly, is the fact that the water, the water ex is controlled by three different entities and they do not agree, and they won't talk to each other. Well, that's not, that's not true. They talk to each other, but I think the challenge now for everybody is how can partnerships be brokered between these entities, and a local group has put together a report right now to propose just that. So I think our question is how can we go in and sensitively work to support efforts on the ground there and offer this approach. And ideally, when we have um, a design center at Carnegie Mellon, we will have some researchers that I hope and PhD students that will be able to be resident in a place like Ojai for a period of time. But you're absolutely right, Peter. It's, it's going to take government getting behind it. And our approach right now is to simply find one project to work on, be in lots of conversation with other educators and students, and let it unfold organically and continue to test and learn. So right now our efforts are focusing on trying to raise funding for stakeholder research to better understand who the groups are and how they're going affected, and then grow capacity in Ojai itself. Tim? So um, most of us, or many of us in this room, come from a maker background yep. and perhaps a connector background. Yeah. So what, how do you feel, or how does transition design affect a maker curriculum, which is represented here at Carnegie? Yeah. What is the transition that a department like this has to go through, both on an undergrad and graduate level? Yeah, it's a really good question. Well, my answer would be that I hope we've, we've already done that for the near future. I mean, we redesigned all of our curricula in 2014 um, to create the ability to put design on behalf of society and the environment at the, at the heart of the undergrad, master's, and PhD programs. In fact, the PhD program is in transition design. 
So I think the design study spine that Dan Lockton is looking after right now is an ideal place for a lot of these ideas to be put on the radar screen, particularly for our undergrads, but making won't go away. I mean, if I, if I didn't emphasize it enough, forgive me, because I think when you get to the level of here's your system, you've got an understanding of the problem, you've got your future vision, all of these acupuncture needles are going to be involved making and they're going to involve designing. Our biggest argument is let's stop doing one-off unconnected things or funding organizations, stop doing a flavor of the month thing, and oh, this month or this year we'll fund this, and next year we'll fund that. If there was a longer term plan and way so that every effort that you undertook was connected and building traction, that's what we're arguing for. So I hypothesize that some students are gonna to gravitate towards working at higher systems levels, and some students are gonna to wanna to make. And we need both. We absolutely need both. When we gave students the opportunity to hybridize a track and to concentrate on two tracks instead of one in our program, what we were essentially doing is enabling them to work, I think, at a higher systems level. But I'm a maker. I started out as a maker, and in order to do this research, I'm designing communications literally myself and letter spacing things. So I don't think that's ever going to go away. But I think what we're trying to do is the very challenging task. I always mime it like this. So I think when you're making, you're down here. Oh, this is great. Look at this material. It's fabulous. And we forget to raise up and understand the greater context within which that activity is situated. So in a way, we're trying to educate students to be more agile, to understand what it means to go down and, and work a material and solve a problem very tactically, but also raise up periodically and understand what it's connected to. And I don't think my education did that at all. I had to learn it over the, very, <laughs> the arc of a very long career. So part of what we're trying to do is ask who's got a proclivity for what. And because we need people working in all of those areas. And I would never want to be associated with a program that didn't honor making. It's hugely important. Stuart? Um, Terry, even for those of us who are kind of in the water day in, day out, this is a really valuable, or perhaps especially for those of us who are, this is a valuable yep. opportunity to look up and look around and yeah. remind ourselves of the overall context or, or a version of it. What I wanted to ask you to expand on a little bit is this metaphor of the acupuncturist, mm -hmm. because you know we map uh, the baggage of the uh, of the metaphor, the site of origin, to the target that yep. we're trying to understand. Yep. And um, this is important here because the uh, the when you have an acupuncturist working with a body, yep. there's just one acupuncturist, yep. and there's one body, yep. and the the kind of curatorial and medical and other kinds of expertise that go into making those selections yep. where to intervene yep. come from a unified logic yes. of sorts. Yep. When you have, when the body is the world yep. and uh, each person who may choose to act in it is yep. their own acupuncturist, yep. you have all kinds of logics and illogics swarming all over it. Yep. And I'm wondering how, in, in making this metaphorical leap from, <laughs> from the kind of relatively tidy and comprehensible scale of an individual human body, where we can get that, how we can preserve or reconstitute mm -hmm. the, the, assembly, the assembly logic yeah. of, of, the, of the acupuncture without resorting to more command and control yeah. Uh, yeah. and a blueprint yeah. Uh, according to which every acupuncturist must um, adhere. Uh, adhere yeah. yeah, it's a really good point and definitely points out the limitation of metaphors. Um, I, would say, I would say that perhaps this realm of cosmopolitan localism 
And for those of you that don't know what that is, we're, we're, we think that that's a really important thing. It's the idea that future lifestyles probably need to be more place-based and local and have a deeper understanding of local conditions and definitely weather patterns. But that because we are, for the first time in human history, globally connected, we have this amazing opportunity to share information and technology. So we suspect it's going to look something like intense networks where place-based action is studied from the beginning with the idea of scaling it and sharing it. So everything we're doing in Ojai is being shared. It's constituting a network of people all focused on how do we work that very thing out and sharing information and always asking what in this solution or what in this situation is unique and place-based and what is rather archetypal and can be shared. Now, beyond that, I probably don't have a way to answer you except to say absolutely agree. Um, we are passionate about the need for this conversation to be global and, can, and integrate many cultural perspectives and many different disciplines because no group of people, no single institution, and certainly no single discipline is going to be able to begin to build a body of knowledge. I think the best purpose the acupuncture metaphor probably serves for me is this idea that we have to move from one-off unrelated solutions to m interventions in a system whose, whose consequences and reactions we can't predict. Yeah. yeah. Um, I have one question about the idea that you have these three stakeholders in the open mind that you talked about, and you're kind of coming in from the outside and saying, let's bring you together. But traditionally, you know, you have one of those stakeholders who will hire the people to do that yeah. to their benefit. Yeah. You know, probably research that people and figure out how to put them on their heads. So I'm just I'm trying to ask the question of how do you imagine this moving beyond the point where, like, in what case does all three of those people agree to bring in an outside sort of perspective? And yeah. Just one people bringing in and saying how do we? Yeah. No, it's, it's an excellent question. I think a really important thing, again, is to make it look, or uh, the people themselves genuinely have to invite you in. I mean, Cheryl Dahl from Future of Fish, who's now on our faculty and we're working with very closely on this work, and Cheryl is now working on OHI, through her 10 years of working on over global overfishing, the one thing she is really clear about is you have to be invited in. And because you can't sell your way in, and, and you have to be really clear. I'm not running a design firm, I'm not worried about making a profit right now. We are conducting research, and that has, I think, um, lent us a degree of credibility because we're not making money off the engagement. We're trying to raise money to conduct the research. Um, but Cheryl's work with Future of Fish had to be very different. Because whereas we have a relatively small contained community with Ojai, she was looking at a global wicked problem. And she had to go out and find champions or people who were doing innovative work and figure out how to hook them up. And this is the other twist that we talk about a lot. There, there may be a collection of transition archetypes, and we don't yet know what that catalog is. But we can see that the work that we need to do and we're possibly able to do in Ojai is so different than what she did for 10 years with overfishing. And Cheryl has been working with a, a group of women's shelters in the Bay Area who want to transition. And so that project is going to be entirely different again. But I think that is key. You have to be invited in. Um, I, we have a lot of, of partners who run design firms right now. And so we're working with them to try and ask the question, if this is work you're doing 
for profit, even if it's a little bit of profit, how is that possible? Is it possible? Now, Cheryl has solved that problem by getting her company certified as a B Corp. Does everybody know what a B Corp is? Yeah, look that up, folks. It's a, it's a company that has to pass stringent um, certification guidelines, and they basically have to be working for people, planet, and profit, not just profit. So that brings an entirely different dynamic to an enterprise. Like if my design firm had been a B Corp, boy, the world would have been a really different place. And you will get a certain kind of entree. Um, but I think the great, that is the question. Every question here has been one of the questions that we have to continue to look at and answer. Talk a lot about observation, which being the most difficult part of the waiting. Yeah. How do you maintain buy-in and that sense of being invited into community where you're waiting for observation that you are observing? Secondly, who is doing the observation? Right. Are you interviewing or yeah. Interviewing? We're not there yet, but we are speculating that it's going to be all of those and that it's not just a point where, oh, we're going to do all these inv- interventions and then we're going to wait. I think it's, it's, it's going to be simultaneous. It's like cooking a meal, <laughs> even though I don't cook. Um, you know, there's many, there's many pots on the boil, and some things are almost done, and other things are starting. And it's more a metaphorical um, acknowledgement of the fact that we almost never do that. I mean, I ran a firm for many years. I've been a professional designer for over 30 And I never stopped and had any time to really think or observe the results of what I did, not in the time needed. Now, you might go through testing cycles, but what we're talking about is really observing how a system responds. But I think it's going to not look like we work and work and then we stop, and then we work and work and then we stop. You're observing. I think part of the observation is going to happen through research. I think some of the observation is hopefully going to happen on behalf of the community itself. You know, one of the things we're talking about in Ojai right now is hosting a series of dinner parties to just build awareness, you know, and and get more people on board with the idea of a long-term process that everyone's undertaking. I think psychologically, it's the difference between thinking you're going to run a sprint and a marathon. And how do you get people up to sort of huh, run a marathon? But you have to, ha- you have to go for some low-hanging fruit and have some, some tangible results quickly. But even those, I think we're advocating that you, we think more carefully and not rush to prediction. I mean, what we designers do is we look at a situation and we say, ah, oh, I think it needs that. I'll do a little bit of research and I'm going to design this in there. I'm going to impose it on the system and Maybe test a little bit and we're done. We're done. Yeah, does that? Okay, Mark and then, and then Mike. Michael. Um, well, since you're collecting metaphors. Uh, <laughs> I got a ton uh, of them. That waiting and observing is, is a, it's not passive, as you said. It's, yeah. it's waiting like a gardener waits. Yes. It's waiting with attention yeah. and intention. That's right. And uh, someone we've learned a lot from, uh, Sam Painter, who talks about strategies, participation strategies. Yeah. So how do we, uh, participation is key to everything you're talking about. Yeah. The community yep. owns the process. Yep. And the decision about, is this worth keeping alive, or should we mm-hmm. have this, this experiment? And so, yeah. Um, his, his two-year periods are called let a thousand flowers bloom. Yeah. And then we'll see. Yeah. And Much better said than I did. Well, uh, you know, and I think the question I have is in the three-part flyover of process, um, there's a vision, and then there's intervention and waiting. Um, some of what you said made me think you you see the vision not as the destination you're trying to implement, 
but as a catalyst, as a as its own kind of experiment. We use the term attractor. Yeah. So now it attracts people to something. Yeah. And then it's part of the loop. It gets revised. I think, yes. Yeah, I didn't go into that whole yeah. thing tonight, and Cameron would have my hide for not having gone into that yeah. tonight. But the idea is, yeah, the vision is constantly being updated and evolving based on the outcome of these interventions so that you're... Up. Yeah, so it's a kind of a living, breathing... Um, he always said, okay, if you've decided to fly to the moon, you get a little way out, and then all of a sudden you glimpse Saturn, and you say, oh, I want to go there instead. So you're constantly... <laughs> You're constantly changing and updating it. Yeah, Michael. I was I was curious, um, and this has been a challenge in some of the stuff that I've done too. But this question, follow on your point about the question of participation. Um, you know, a lot of these really successful projects have been in Scandinavia, mm -hmm. have been in you know New York City and Ojai and places that have a lot of resources. Um, and I was wondering how like. What strategies have you guys looked at to scaffold participate? Like, and, and I guess I've come to the conclusion that participation is a luxury. Yeah. You know, and not, yeah. not everybody can afford participation. Yeah. Um, like, what strategies do you guys work with to scaffold participation for yeah. like these? And you alluded to it a little bit earlier with like the, you know, the voices that don't get heard. How do you how do you work with that? Well, I think first, probably acknowledging that nobody's ever, you will ever have everybody participating. And even in Ojai, it's a, it's a very affluent community overall, but there are people that are not affluent. And they're not going to show up for a workshop like that. So I think our challenge, and this is something that I feel Cheryl has really developed very well, is an approach to going out and doing field research, and she usually conducts it with a team that's an anthropologist and a journalist, that you're going out and you're actually talking to people, and you're trying to get at all of these essential questions and bringing it back. And then in that case, what the transition design team would probably be doing is parsing that, looking for insights, looking for patterns, um, right now we're in a conversation about can you get their feedback about the future through that kind of research. But these are all things that need to be explored. But for me, the essential thing is always to think, who won't be heard? And right now our transition design seminar groups are working on Pittsburgh-based problems, and one of the teams is looking at the decline of pollinators. Well, the biggest stakeholder group there are the bees. And it's like, how are you going to find out what the bees need? But I would argue it's not really that hard to find out what bees need in order to survive and thrive. Um, but we're not used to thinking about the ecosystem and even the non-living parts of the environment as stakeholders. So one of the big challenges is how do we shift our mindsets so that it would seem crazy not to. Oh. Yeah, one more. So I'm uh, teaching on the third floor. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm teaching, I'm currently teaching, and I have for about uh, 10 years a studio that's called uh, uh, um, uh, Acupuncture Urbanism. Oh, so great. Kind of, uh, <laughs> I'm very excited to be down here and give a lecture. Uh, my research focuses on the commons. Uh huh, um, great. And for me, the, the, the kind of elephant in the room, in a way, is mm -hmm. uh, neoliberal capitalism. Yeah. Uh, why is it that you're focusing so much on climate change and not uh, addressing? Or, I mean, oh. even when, it, when I read your brochures, yeah. like, capitalism never occurs. Uh, and that's something that has always kind of uh, intrigued me. Well, I have always left that to Cameron, and we absolutely see neoliberalism as a huge problem. But to be honest, that's not a, bang, a drum I'm going to bang on in my current job. That's not something I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to focus on other kinds of things, but it needs to be addressed. And I think some of our writings have addressed neoliberal capitalism. Economics, but you're right. You're you're absolutely right. 
it, it should be at the heart of everything, and it is not for a variety of reasons. So let's talk. Yeah? Yeah, it, the whole lecture could have been about that. The whole lecture could have been about stakeholders, but absolutely, absolutely. I mean, we do talk about reconceptualizing new forms of everyday life, which I think. I mean, just to follow up. I mean, you know, it's like I, I, I'm. Very, it's, a, it's a very self-interested question. I've just yeah. kind of moved here from Europe yeah. uh, to kind of a private university. Is this just a taboo to kind of uh, mm. uh, kind of uh, address these issues up front when you work for kind of a, 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 a private uh, university? I, you know, I've only been here for nine years, and I'm not going to answer that. <laughs> but but I don't think so. I'm just saying. How do I answer this honestly? I do a lot of reading about the problem with our political system. And I do not feel like that's something I want to take on while I'm the head of the School of Design. I, I think it's a really big problem. And I think that we have gotten criticism about not being political enough. And I think it's absolutely valid criticism. But we haven't yet decided how we are going to handle it. So I would welcome having dinner to maybe talk about that very thing. Yeah? Jonathan? I've also just moved here from Europe. And, uh, <laughs> and I was quite pleased to see the word capitalism not appear so much in the <laughs> literature, but rather a kind of critical discussion about that which capitalism includes. Uh, happening in the talks and in the online lectures and the brochures, I suppose. So I, I was quite drawn to that. I think there's something sometimes quite distracting about the word um, and the different kind of connotations that occur. Um, yeah. I, I'm serious. I would welcome a conversation with you about it. Absolutely. OK, one more question, and then we're going. We're going. No more? OK, thanks, everybody.